Our next panel is our government and public policy panel. And I'm, I will introduce uh, the moderator of our panel and then turn it over to him and, and we can uh, dig in. So walking up is our very own executive committee member, Peter McKay. And uh, everybody, in Can <laughs> everybody who's Canadian knows Peter McKay, all right? He's a very famous member of parliament. He served in very uh, dignified offices there, uh, including the former attorney general of Canada and the minister of defense of Canada. And he comes from uh, the the northeastern side of the country, Nova Scotia. So, Peter, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the panelists and take it from there. Thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, welcome. Good morning. I have flown in from the east coast, where climate change is certainly uh, wreaking havoc. We had uh, hurricane conditions there a few weeks ago, and uh, I must say it's uh, it's quite. Uh, interesting to be traveling again as well. The last time I was in this room, I made an off-color remark about a hockey uh, analogy uh, concerning the Conservative Party of Canada. I'm tempted to say something similar this time about missing an open net, but I will restrain myself uh, as I want to leave here unscathed. We, uh, on a serious note, we have some terrific um, experts with us for this particular discussion. Jeff Labonte is uh, the Assistant Deputy Minister for Natural Resources Canada, uh, Lands and Mining Sector. Uh, he's coming to us uh, from the capital in Ottawa, to your capital in Washington. Um, and Samir Fazili, I hope I'm pronouncing Fazili, Fazili is uh, the Deputy Director of the United States President's uh, National Economic Council, and her portfolios include supply chain and critical mi minerals. So we couldn't have two more uh, insightful leaders in the field to uh, discuss this important issue of critical minerals and their strategic challenges and opportunities that present for both our countries. Collaboration seems to be the, the obvious place to start, perhaps. And uh, so, Samir, perhaps we could start with you in terms of your view of how Canada and the United States are grappling with what is an enormous challenge, but on the other hand, given all of these factors around climate change, what's happening with conflict in the world today, and uh, the, the rush that we all feel, the urgency um, to address some of the, the difficulties with, uh, with coping with greenhouse gas emissions and how uh, some countries are, are taking this seriously. Certainly we are in North America. Other countries, not so much. But critical uh, minerals factor enormously into the global response and our North American response. So collaboration between government as an element of this. Yeah. Um, you know, to answer that, let me let me start by, um, you know, orienting um, our audience to kind of the steps and actions that we are taking here in the U.S. because that lays the framework for, I think, why we are so um, excited about the opportunities for collaboration between the two countries. I mean, I think the prior panel talked a lot about um, the challenges, and so we're all wide-eyed about the challenges. Um, you know, our president, President Biden, has laid out a really ambitious agenda to decarbonize the U.S. economy, and that included a goal of 50% um, of new vehicles sold by 2030 being electric. And, um, and uh, you know, in these first 20 months in office, we've actually had um, some pretty landmark successes on the legislative side um, and also um, put in place an economic and industrial strategy that has um, really awakened private capital and mobilized private investments in um, clean energy technologies, um, not just electric vehicles and battery manufacturing, but the full supply chain with over $100 billion invested there. And you've seen consumer adoption of these electric vehicles um, triple since since taking office. Um, but we know that we're not the only country uh, making this transition to a clean energy future. And so just a few numbers for us to just have in our head 
Um, we know that the demand for critical minerals is set to skyrocket. You know, by some estimates, it's 4,000 percent by 2040 for uh, minerals like lithium and graphite. Um, uh, you see wildly varying estimates about the supply demand gap and the price impacts that's going to have. But uh, you know, you know, recent BCG study says the price has increased tenfold in the past two years on the lithium side, um, and says at least we have enough supply to meet demand. But by 2030, they start to project some modest shortfalls of around four percent. But and by 2035, see gaps accelerating to the 25 percent range. Um, and this is in a context, and the prior panel kind of talked about this, where, I just, you know, um, the exploration and the technology is still catching up. But by today's, with, with today's kind of um, technologies, we have about 6% of world reserves between our, our two countries. Um, but a lot of innovation going into um, scale, uh, uh, geothermal brines, remining, other opportunities to extract the resource. So we know that demand is moving fast. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about the kind of battery chemistries that are going to dominate um, in the future, and that's going to really affect the volume of the minerals. And so there's a lot of uncertainty around private investment, which is why we've taken so much um, effort to um, provide a set of incentives and drive some regulatory and legal certainty to the market to mobilize um, capital. One thing we did early on was lay out a strategy, a, a kind of industrial strategy around critical minerals early on um, that would uh, lay out a framework for how we were going to advance our nation's energy security as we transition towards uh, clean en the, a clean energy future. Um, the goal that we laid out there was to secure an end-to-end -end supply chain for critical minerals that would reduce our dependence on unreliable supply chains, ensure our national security, and reflect our values for high labor and environmental standards while also promoting indigenous rights um, and tribal and community consultations. The tactics that we would put in place, um, <coughs> we had three core kind of elements to the strategy, recognizing that you're going to have to take a mineral by mineral approach um, as you do this. The conditions, um, the geology, the science around each mineral is very different and the industry capabilities um, are very different. So the three kind of core elements to our approach are expanding sustainable and responsible domestic production. Um, second, reforming our domestic rules and regulations to strengthen standards and increase efficiency, something we talked a fair amount about in the prior panel. And then third is working with allies and partners to develop more secure, diverse, and sustainable um, supply chains. Uh, we've taken a number of actions to, to, to implement this strategy, and that includes securing um, funding under the Defense Production Act um, for uh, critical minerals production, processing, and recycling. Um, we've established a mining reform working group led by our Department of Interior um, that has done a lot of consultation right now to get input from all stakeholders about what direction they want to see all those reforms head. And then on the global side, launching multilateral partnerships like the um, Partnership on Global Infrastructure and Investment with the G7. Um, and uh, last month, the president announced a new initiative um, that would bring all of this work together called the American Battery Materials Initiative that's going to help us align the federal resources, enhance all this collaboration, and support faster and fairer permitting. And that brings me to like the collaboration with Canada, because the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act has us really poised to move at greater speed and scale. Um, in executing on this mineral and battery um, strategy, um, this industrial strategy. Uh, Canada, as everyone in this room knows, is our largest trading partner. We have highly integrated supply chains, and so um, um, we are well poised to build off of that history of collaboration and expand it further in the critical mineral space and up the, the value chain, up the full value chain. Um, uh, there are three particular areas where I think we're particularly well poised for near term kind of immediate action on joint cooperation. The first is production and processing of critical minerals. I mentioned the DPA investments that we have. I saw that then after I got scheduled, uh, my colleague Matt Malinowski from the Department of Defense is your lunch speaker, so you'll probably hear more on this from him. But um, we have such tight collaboration between um, our two countries on the defense industry, and that includes um, an integrated defense supply chain, and Canada uh, is designated as part of the U.S. industrial base. So we know that the dep our Department of Defense has the ability to make uh, its DPA investments in Canada and in, in, in um 
companies domiciled in Canada. Second, um, fostering the development of high road markets. Uh, we have already committed uh, to work together uh, to identify projects with high ESG standards for joint funding to reduce the level of investment risk. Um, and to increase private investment flows to projects with high ESG standards. Um, the clean energy incentives that we just passed in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, the tax, a uh, whole bevy of, of tax incentives, um, they provide bonus credits for projects that create good paying jobs and offer quality training. Um, we're also seeing um, our private companies um, mobilize around creating industry standards. So, you know, the U.S. automakers like Ford, GM, and Tesla um, have joined uh, uh, private standing, standard-setting bodies like the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. Um, I know the European, major European automakers have also joined that. And then the third area where uh, we, we see a lot of opportunity and already doing a lot of collaboration is on supply chain security. Um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, again, offers a consumer tax credit for help for um, purchasing of um, new electric vehicles. Um, claiming the full credit requires North American and free trade par uh, partner content, um, and, uh, and that applies to batteries and to minerals themselves. A in addition, um, it, there's um, a new kind of provision in there around um, foreign entities of concern, and if um, the supply chain uh, contains content from foreign entities of concern, you don't qualify for the credit. Those provisions won't take effect until 24 or 20 and 25, just depending on how they're written. But um, we know that both our part, our countries have been strengthening our kind of investment screening regime and um, taking other steps to make sure that um, we are um, looking at ways to um, support the development of more diverse global supply chains, not just, and because um, I think we talked about this in the prior panel as well, the pandemic made um, us realize that high dependency on supply chains that are have too much geographic concentration risk, it doesn't serve anyone's interests and in the private sector or uh, consumers or workers or, or, or governments themselves. And so um, we're all looking at the new set of tools we can all mobilize together between the government and the private sector to help uh, create um, a new set of global value chains um, that aren't only focused on short-term efficiency, but are kind of more optimized towards longer-term resiliency, especially as climate change um, will really increase the level of um, risk and interruption that supply chains might face. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll pause there. Sure. Well, Samira, you've covered a, a great deal of, uh, of subject matter. And I want to give Jeff an opportunity to provide a, a Canadian perspective. But if I might, Jeff, just in, in your response, if you could touch a little bit on how, so, and I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that you're coming at this from a, a public service perspective, but politics, of course, is omnipresent. And we're here to uh, be forthright and factual, and I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot, but it breaks down, you would have to admit, at times when, uh, government policies don't actually align, and, and you, you referenced uh, electric vehicles. And there was a time, it seems to be on better footing now, where it looked like Canada and the U.S. were a bit wrong-footed uh, in terms of how we were going to deal with the, the policy of electric vehicles by a certain set date. So I'll, I'll turn it to you, Jeff. I know we, we've, uh, we've laid a good foundation here through Samira's references, um, but from a Canadian perspective. <laughs> Great. Well, listen, thank you very much for the chance to join the conversation and could probably repeat a fair bit of the, of the, of the context of the previous panel, but maybe just to bring some, some perspectives that will come to the same place, but from uh, a, dif a different starting point. I, I think the first issue that's the most interesting of this is the critical minerals construct and what's happening with it is really a nexus of some very interesting um, human and government issues and issues of society we're dealing with. I mean, on a one scale, it's about economic development and changing and about growing um, a different set of requirements and things that are driving economic development and change around the world. And that's something that's happened quickly and it's happening at a much more accelerated pace. And so there's volatility, there's change, there's demand curves. Um, Samir has mentioned some of those as examples that have, an, have economies and industry trying to figure out and trying to kind of invest in the right places, but managing risk associated with those investments. At the same time, there's a national security dimension 
that finds itself at the nexus of how economies operate and how economic security is part of national security. And we look at economic security in some contexts and geographic concentration and supply restrictions and demands that are happening around the world. Exercising of market forces and exercising of, of authority within markets and within different economies is not necessarily always following exactly the paths we would expect. And so that is another point of concern from a public policy perspective that brings government and industry in the same place, but also trying to make sure that what the signaling is happening, private investment is moving in the direction it needs to be, but government is trying to step in where it needs to and trying to signal to markets to bring stability. Because some of these transitions and the scale of the investment is such of significant proportion, there's a lot to be won and lost in depending on how that turns. And then the latter point is about the transition and the change around energy sources and energy storage, energy management, energy distribution, and the use of energy in our economies, in our lives, in the way that we work, the way that we play, the way that we enjoy uh, the quality of life that we have as a society. So when you put all those things together, it brings a lot of really interesting public policy dimensions together. And so speaking about this, I think it's implicit that we're talking about industrial policy, and we're talking about industrial policy of a large scale that, as Western democracies, we haven't seen in a very, very long time. Um, references to usually world war events, events of catastrophic change happening in society are parallels that are brought about that we're experiencing now. So when we look at, for example, the mining sector, and if I kind of zoom in on Canada for a minute, as the previous panel mentioned, Canada is a resource-driven uh, commodity economy that has substantial resources and assets and has been well-developed at bringing those resources to market for many different economic returns and raising the social living and, and prosperity of, of Canada and its different regions and provinces. Our constitution has most of those resources belonging to the provincial jurisdictions, which means the scale and pace at which the development occurs in the legal framework is one that's more localized within a national construct. So that is actually an interesting dimension that allows for both variation, but also brings, um, if you will, practices that can be modeled across the country as one jurisdiction learns from another and as we kind of optimize. So when we look at that, Canada Produce is a large supplier. So unlike the situation here in the United States, we're not a net importer of many of the minerals that are on our critical minerals list. And many of our critical minerals that we have are not actually developed because we don't actually have a demand for them in our domestic economy. So we have this resource potential and we have this opportunity. We also have a huge capacity. So Canada's mining community has some 60 different minerals that we produce. We have some 200 different operating mines and some 10,000 estimated potential projects and in, in the liking from the exploration stages into the construct of being able to potentially produce mines. So we have a skill set in this area where we have capital markets, we have engineering expertise, we have companies that operate around the country and around the world. So it's an area where Canada has a, a strong capacity and a strong ability to bring more to bear. So we have a opportunity to supply more into the global market. So our critical mineral strategy starts with looking at increasing supply, not dissimilar from the U.S. example of increasing supply for domestic purposes and to think about supporting domestic value added and industry development and manufacturing. All of those are shifting as we talk. So we talk about nearshoring, friendshoring, reshoring, about bringing different supply chains back to North America, back to our respective countries. That's a transition as well that requires investment and structuring and change, and one in which what are the features that governments are putting in place to try and drive that. So that second part from our strategy is to try and grow not just the sale and development of the commodity, but the actually the, the, the processing and ability for that commodity be used for economic returns domestically and in a North American context. Our strategy also then focuses on collaborating multi and through multilateral fora and bilaterally, bilaterally with our allies. So we share the same interest and have been collaborating with the United States on critical minerals for almost four years. We have an action plan, we have work underway and a number of things and I can speak to that at quite a bit of um, detail as, as, uh, as, our, uh, as our panel might provide for. But I also would underline the other component where we work domestically but also think globally. And so it's helpful to think about our domestic policy driving our international policy and our relationship with countries, particularly the United States being our largest partner. But also in times of 
that rapid change around the world and pressure around the world, our, our economies and our countries generally run together. And we usually run closer together rather than further apart. So as we look at some of the things that are underway now, it's natural that we would expect to partner more and that collaboration to, to, to escalate. And talking through that collaboration, we share things like indigenous populations, about development in indigenous and regional areas. The not in my backyard issue is one in which the local impact to some of the development activities around mining and processing and industrial activities tend to have local impacts. And those local impacts are felt most um, directly in the construct of where they occur, but yet they occur across our different geographies quite differently. And so we need to think through that. So from our perspective, another component of our strategy, which is m mirrored in the United States strategy, is ensuring that the environmental, social, and governance standards, which we as modern economies and, 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 uh, and democratic countries aspire to not only domestically within our own jurisdictions and within each province, but also that we would expect that our companies and that our economies expect the same of where we source things globally. And so how do we ensure that in moving to meet that demand and finding that supply that's needed to transition as the way we've spoke to for critical minerals that we are not necessarily um, um, winning by losing, meaning we might supply some of those uh, resources and, and discover them and move them from other countries to our own countries, but in a way in which um, the environment has to be cared for, development has to be responsible, benefits have to flow to local, co local governments and local uh, communities that are impacted by development so that we see that messaging kind of find its way and it's another differentiator that helps us on an economic side where sustainability and the ability to produce goods at low carbon uh, in a low carbon fashion can produce the outcomes that we want that consumers in North America are more and more demanding and in Europe and other like-minded economies so these are features that we share with the United States but features that also drive our our domestic policy framework as well and certainly um, I'll probably pause here, but you know the, the alignment, the misalignment between you know um, features of incentives and policy uh, agendas is going to happen when you have two independent countries acting independently in their domestic construct. But the collaboration usually kind of ends up having us find ways in which those things align together. So the Defense Act example of Canada being a destination for U.S. defense procurement because of our integrated. Um, defense economy, the same occurs in our investment frameworks around security, the same occurs around um, just the flow of goods across the border. And we, we see it also in the one last point, which I think will come up further in our conversation, just around energy security and the future of energy security will require mineral security. And so when we think about energy security in North America, the energy flows between our two countries are so so integrated and so stable in terms of whether it's oil or gas or en uh, electricity or renewables. The same we would expect and aspire to be true of mineral security as we lean into the future. And our two economies rely on minerals as a stronger and bigger part of the energy security for North America. I think that's a really good sort of transition point in terms of the, the national security element of this, because you're absolutely right, the energy security, uh, just as in previous debates and, and uh, the renewal of, of the former NAFTA agreement brought into play some of that discussion as well. But, um, and you've both referenced the, the volatility that we're experiencing, perhaps unprecedented in, in our lifetime in terms of the, the threat that seems to appear from abroad. Um, China uh, is going to be part of this conversation, uh, to be sure, as they are in so many different ways. But the need for uh, a critical mineral or a critical mineral strategy uh, where Canada is able to support this security relationship, a as well as the economic relationship, um, is inevitably going to bring into the discussion how uh, we're going to be able to supply the, the bulk of resources necessary for the auto sector, but for this green transition that, uh, that both countries are going through. Um, so it comes down to a question of cost, because these, like we've seen in the energy sector, the, the mining sector is an enormously capital, uh, extensive investment for both the private sector and, and government uh, increasingly is trying to sort of stay hands off. So where does that um, guarantee or that, that base of defense infrastructure come from if 
if there is this capital intensive nature for these mega projects uh, that the, the Defense Production Act in the United States uh, could be part of the vehicle for this in terms of investment, perhaps not exclusively, but an anchor investor. Um, not sure. I haven't heard much discussion in Canada about the openness to have that type of investment coming in. Certainly there are uh, a lot of warning shots that are coming now from other external foreign investment, mainly China. But uh, this, this idea that the National Defense Procurement Act can underwrite some of these big projects for critical minerals. Just interested in your thoughts on that. Well, I think you've made, referenced a couple things. I mean, I think when we look at the national security posture, there has been some changes domestically in Canada recently about foreign investment. Right. Um, and that's simply to say that the critical mineral sector is being treated um, under increased scrutiny. That scrutiny is really looking at where foreign investment is coming from and we're expecting that um, foreign investment will not um, not move in the direction of state-owned state enterprises and other things going forward. And that statement has been made, and there's lawyers in the room who will be able to quote it exactly in terms of how it fits in the Investment Canada Act, and happy to talk about that offline. And I think, sorry to interrupt you, but Minister Champagne has quite recently uh, issued a bit of an edict that took three uh, state-owned enterprises out of uh, circulation in Canada. That's correct. So, so we have, uh, if I will, um, intensified the, the security dimension of foreign investment and control over the resources. Um, but your question was about the Defense Procurement Act and seeing whether that was... So one of the issues with not naturally moving in the direction that we've moved in is that there are, there, there are some of the capital that would have potentially come from state-owned enterprises is not going to be um, moved into the market. But some of the potential... Um, increased investment could come from things like the United States Defense Procurement Act and other allies who are looking to invest in, in partnerships and sustainability and looking at the longer term. So one of the volatility impacts is the, the impact of things are changing quickly. Mines tend to take um, a lot of investment and they tend to take long periods of time to develop before they reach production, but they tend to have long runs that follow. So it's a, it's a perfect scenario for people who want to build supply chain security and stability because there's a long run and there's a long opportunity that can, can extend over time that brings that stability. Um, the, the pressure point now is, of course, everybody wants the resources tomorrow. Um, and there's this a lag between when you can set up the actors and set up the investors and be able to kind of connect the dots. And that's where I think the volatility is over the next little while and where government collaboration and government intervention is likely trying to smooth that so that the private sector can step in and play the role that it always has and just um, can enable that longer run. So for now, I think uh, we're, we are certainly in that space of welcoming, and we always will be, um, looking at the recognition of the time dimension that we have to manage in that capital. Sure. Samira, that is uh, a perfect bridge to this sense of urgency that uh, I think everyone is feeling in this transition period. Certainly in energy, that uh, it's inescapable. Um, but I, I do want to come back to this question of how um, the United States will react if Canada, as the example here, but other countries as well, European Union countries, are, are not moving quick enough. And in, in the case of Canada, we've seen this in our energy sector, where, yes, there is still a flow, but uh, much of it has been left in the ground and, and will be. Um, there's a fear in some circles in Canada with respect to ESG, this becoming prohibitive for direct foreign investment or for development, period. And so I, I'm just trying to uh, draw out how the United States will react to a lag time in a different jurisdiction when it comes to regulatory issues, when it comes to issues around consultation, issues that will not perhaps uh, be seen as, as urgent or responsive to the needs of the United States. Yeah. Um, I think uh, on, on our side, uh, we recognize that having deep relationships mean, means having deep respect for the the processes and the politics in um, other jurisdictions as we all kind of work collectively to um, help the world move to the net zero transition. 
um, we have always been able to build from a relationship that um, is based on honest dialogue um, and deep, deep cooperation at the at the technical levels. And um, and what is remarkable is that as a uh, as, as government, as kind of like the senior leadership in the government's change over time, you have still seen the cooperation always deepen um, between our countries or often has just kept deepening in with the Inflation Reduction Act right now. I mean, we're in a posture where we're moving fast and we're moving aggressively um, um, and are eager to see other countries come along and will continue to find um, ways to encourage and to line and also to um, see places where our incentives can help support the transitions um, that other countries are are making. I mean, like one example, which isn't a Canadian example, is as we look at the production tax credits that we're establishing here in the U.S. for clean energy production, we know that that's going to bring like European offshore wind producers here into the U.S. So um, we think that there's opportunities for um, companies who are headquartered in Canada or working in Canada to be working across um, the border. And we don't um, think that there is like a strong risk of us moving, um, it, n- not moving um, enough in um, lockstep, even if we're moving in different speeds in different places. Um, I think both of our countries are hydrocarbon rich countries too. Um, and we are uh, looking at all the ways that we are t- um, trying to responsibly manage our own energy transition um, as well, because um, we know there's going to be, th- there is a transition period, and the war um, in Ukraine has uh, made everyone aware that we have to um, take careful steps, but that working with allies and partners is actually a good way to manage the transition risk across countries, which is why our work with the Europeans to help strengthen their energy security, I think, is a great example of the kind of the way that collaboration and partnership is key to um, helping allies kind of mutually um, address these issues. Beyond the discussion of the transition itself and the use, the, the use of critical minerals to our collective strength because Canada in particular uh, when it comes to these critical minerals which can be identified uh, we were really born on third base I mean we we uh, didn't earn it um, by virtue of our geography (coughs) we have uh, we have been blessed with both energy and critical minerals but I want to lead to a, a bit of a discussion and I know we're really pressed for time but about the Arctic and so the volatility the geopolitical volatility uh, that's weighing heavily on, on the minds of everyone, governments uh, in particular, uh, and the nature of these conflicts as they evolve, cyber attacks, um, saber rattling around nuclear, these, these are perhaps uh, paralyzing in some capitals in terms of how they simultaneously deal with energy needs. There's going to be a, a, a real crunch occur in Europe, as we are, we are hearing, um, because of the cutoff of the flow of natural gas from Russia. China is becoming more and more menacing uh, in the South China Sea and and, uh, potential naval blockades. So all of these are are factors that can't be ignored, but there is a very specific vulnerability when we talk about security in North America, and that is the Arctic, also tied into, of course, changes due to climate. But we have a very menacing neighbor just across those Arctic waters, Um, You can't see it from there, um, but it's there. And that that neighbor, uh, not posing any immediate threat, but is also interested in resources, as is China. Now, the Arctic is a a very pristine and special part of of North America. Again, shared responsibility in parts of the Arctic. And um, the Canada-U.S. Law Institute did a specific... um, discussion, panel discussion, several on, uh, on the Arctic. But I'm, I'm wondering how we reconcile as a country on this collaboration side, on the national security piece, the special um, restrictive in some ways policy and uh, responses that are going to be required. Very difficult to operate there eight months of the year, um, even though the waters are opening up. But 
untapped critical min mineral deposits, undoubtedly. And the race to, uh, to regulate and properly uh, extract what we have north of 60 is going to be even more challenging. So just a, a little reflection from both of you on the specifics of critical minerals in the Arctic region. Sure. Um, well, you've nailed the certain, um, I think, view that the Arctic is a special and unique part of North America. And Canada and the United States share Arctic um, shorelines. We share land boundaries in, in Arctic north of 60 areas. And we share indigenous populations that are the, the, the primary residents of those areas and areas where there are rich uh, natural resources. And the development of those resources has occurred in some instances, and it's it's a very it's a very challenging environment to work in. Um, that's on land, um, and we share that part. There, then there's the part about the, the the coastline and the Arctic Ocean, how that fits um, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, um, the internal Canadian waters the, you're referring to, the and the Beaufort Sea, and, and the Beaufort Sea, and the sort of the, the fact that the boundaries and the geography of the areas is still an area in which a, a world-based rules system running through the United Nations Convention and trying to work through the Arctic nations through the Arctic Council is working to try and establish that the Arctic and how it's managed should be managed in a, in a cohesive way. The game's certainly changed uh, with one of the neighbors perhaps um, uh, having uh, uh, you know, a, a much different perspective now. Uh, and that brings, I think, a, a much more increased attention around how do our, how do our security postures change to reflect that both from a security point of view, but also presence on the landscape, um, the minerals and how they'll be developed. For, for the most part, the minerals on land are fairly well understood. I think the minerals that exist in the seabed are still uh, subject to international conversations as to what happens outside of exclusive economic zones. So those are, I think, active areas that are not likely to change in terms of um, our interest in them and our ability to kind of manage them, although there are processes that, that are underway to help do those things. Those are long-term processes just the way that they are. And I know you know that, but it's interesting because you know we go through periods of time where I think things are less uh, volatile, more stable. The Arctic has been an area where it has been very volatile in the past. It, we're exiting a period of stability, and we're entering back into a period where there is some increased volatility, and that will, I think, change the security posture in a number of different ways. It's a really good point, Jeff. The, uh, and, and the forums that allow for um, countries, Arctic, uh, Arctic nations, uh, and the Arctic Council is suspended currently. Um, you've both referenced the Aboriginal people of the North who are really uh, central to this discussion in terms of resource development. And so, Samira, just to give you an opportunity to comment on this as well in terms of the, the U.S. perspective on the pace, I guess, and the tone and, and how we, we continue in a productive way uh, to manage resources and expectations about those resources. You know, um, just building off what you said about uh, the kind of indigenous communities um, who, who um, call that region home, um, as we set out to um, develop a framework for our mining reform and how we were going to approach that, we um, have, have said that it's important to recognize that in some instances you're going to want to protect special places and you're going to want to identify special places and you may need to adopt a more restrictive posture in, in some of those places. I mean, our, um, our framework is really different from yours just given that uh, we, we don't have federal ownership of the, of the minerals in most instances. But uh, and then the second uh, piece of um, our work on thinking about how do you responsibly manage development in land that is owned or, um, in, in our context, it's tribal land or is um, a, a kind of has a special cultural significance to tribal communities has been to um, identify places where uh, you can uh, identify, pre-identify that those are kind of high conflict sites, what, what we refer to as high conflict sites, um, because in the consultations we've done with industry, they say they, they don't have good resources available right now to make known where 
they might want to avoid doing exploration activities um, um, of various kinds. So we're looking at opportunities of where, what steps and actions can we take to help signal that and to help create that inf- uh, that kind of public record. And the other uh, place we've um, identified as an area where uh, we could, again, kind of bring more efficiencies into the market here is um, identify find some opportunities for pre-consultations and pre-notifications. Again, like our, our system I know is really different from yours, but um, um, on when it comes to mining and exploration activities on public lands, um, uh, there there isn't um, a requirement for uh, the companies to, to currently um, have to notify um, others that they're starting some kind of pre-activities. And so they are often very far in the development of their kind of investment strategies and their plans before um, local communities or indigenous communities are even aware of what's ha- what, what's happening. And so we're looking for opportunities to strengthen that. And then um, on the capital side, you know, I've talked so much about the investment and the dollars that we're putting behind um, investing in private companies and de-risking things for companies, but we equally are have um, resources available to support um, uh, uh, tribal consultation and capacity building so that they can um, identify and understand kind of the issues and risks inherent in a project, but also support um, um, tribal ownership of energy development projects. Um, in the Inflation Reduction Act, we... Um, the, the funding available through our Department of Energy, they have special tribal loan guarantee programs that will allow for energy development on um, tribal lands, um, as well as the tax credit provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act um, um, have been designed in such a way that tribal nations, um, tribal companies can claim um, those credits because um, there were some changes to the way the tax code um, um, in, in those areas. So. Well, you're, you're right to, uh, to suggest that the, the consultation, the input uh, from our First Nations is, is critical to all of this. And I think, again, not to dwell on the point of the Arctic, but, um, I mean, we had a, a very practical example of their historic knowledge uh, and, and operating capability when we were looking for the Franklin expedition and uh, had spent considerable time and effort and money. And basically, someone in one of the Arc- remote Arctic communities said, it's right over there. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, yeah. they were right. Um, and I'm, I'm not at all trying to draw you into a political discussion on this subject, but foreign interference when it comes to what's happening in North America is, uh, is something that our, our chief of defense staff, so the equivalent of the Joint Chiefs, has raised recently. And he talked about Russia and China not just looking at regime survival, and I would add Iran to this as well, but regime expansion. And so we're, we're in a very aggressive time uh, and space. Um, I referenced uh, Francois-Philippe Champagne uh, having made uh, a very public pronouncement with respect to Chinese investment in certain uh, natural resource companies in Canada. But this increasingly disruptive force um, is not only undeniable, but impossible to ignore. Uh, and this will play a, a tremendous role in the future on all of what we're discussing here in terms of uh, development and transition and use uh, of our resources and critical minerals in particular. Mm-hmm. China plays a tremendous uh, oversized role in this discussion, um, again, by virtue of the fact that they have many of these critical minerals and, and rare earth uh, within their territorial boundaries. But they're, they're being belligerent to say the least. They're, uh, they're throwing their weight around, not just in their region, and becoming more and more disruptive on how the world plans to deal with climate change and, and accelerate this transition. So I, I guess just an open question, how, in your view, will our governments deal with this or replace China's hegemony on critical minerals? And one of the areas I think that we started this conversation with has to be around this collective effort of Western countries. I don't particularly like the, the friend shoring. I, I find it's a little bit glib, but we, we do have to emphasize this collective effort uh, of like-minded countries and values that, uh, that creep into the discussion. 
Um, you know, I, I, I can go first here. Um, the, th this is um, what, what has been remarkable is how much the um, pandemic and the war in Ukraine has, um, I think, really um, woke, woke up the business community to these issues. I think <coughs> the national security community for a long time was saying there's a lot of risk and geopolitical risk in these supply chains. And um, and I, and um, people didn't quite believe it until um, Russia invaded Ukraine. And uh, what we've seen, I mean, we had had data out there for years saying companies can expect to lose over 40% of one year's earnings every 10 years due to supply chain disruptions. But it took, like, the chips crisis shaving 1% off U.S. GDP, driving a quarter of inflation last year for people right. to really realize what these impacts were going to be. Um, and how the, the, the smallest component could um, lead to literally furloughing thousands of workers here um, in the U.S. Um, uh, what you've seen is a shift in company business practices. We're finally starting to see, I think, see some promising early signs that they are diversifying their supply chains as a response. Um, in 2020, um, you had, uh, you, when supply chain managers were... Um, were being surveyed, they, about 55% of them said they, they, they source raw materials from two suppliers. Well, that's up to 80% now. Like you're, it's, what's really key here is that um, like-minded countries who are interested in a rules-based international order and market-based principles, um, not only that we harmonize our regime, but we also are working with the private sector and um, getting them to recognize that they can't only focus on short-term efficiency and lowest cost um, at all moments. Uh, like lowest cost, short-term kind of mindset um, actually leads to higher costs for them and uh, in, in the long run. Um, and I think that through a variety of um, efforts, um, you know, we had a supply chain ministerial this past summer with, um, I think, 18 of our largest uh, trading partners um, where we all made a, a joint commitment on supply chain security and resiliency. And we in the U.S. have also advanced the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, um, which has um, supply chains as a key pillar to advance um, really new models for uh, working with um, our closest trading partners and allies on, um, you know, in, in past eras, it was uh, often a question of reducing kind of tariff barriers was like the animating factor that was driving um, stronger economic integration. Well, now the common problem most of us face is um, unsecure, unreliable supply chains. And so uh, we're in an era of really promising new international cooperation in this era. So just like you don't like French shoring, I hate the term deglobalization because I don't see that happening. I see more partnership, more engagement. What globalization was about was identifying common problems and achieving common solutions. And so we have a new common problem, and that common problem is these um, this hyper-concentration in supply chains and the climate change and the threat that that is posing. Um, and so it only makes sense for in this era that kind of the, those of us who are strong proponents of international integration and cooperation and trade, kind of the frameworks need to shift as to what we're trying to solve for. So our advantage is, in fact, pulling, pulling together mm -hmm. out of necessity, really, and, and our ability to do so, where other countries are loath to find friends that perhaps uh, want to be on their side. Um, from a Canadian perspective, um, do, you, do you see this as, as an opportunity for Canada perhaps to, to step up a little more where there is a necessity, as with energy, which I, you know, I would argue that we've kind of missed the boat somewhat by not having the infrastructure in place, and that's my regional bias coming from the East Coast where we had the Energy East pipeline that got tanked. But I, I think the, uh, the opportunity now with critical minerals uh, similarly presents Canada as a potential leader for, uh, for the, the, not just the transition, but some of the innovation, some of the ability to, uh, to partner with countries that, uh, that require those minerals. And, and you know, that, that's also part of the... the 
the reining in, or perhaps in some ways trying to curtail uh, some of the aggressive behavior that we've seen on the, on the geopolitical scene of late. So Canada's on the cusp of, of perhaps once again having a, a great opportunity fall in our lap if we're ready to, to, you know, to act on it. Well, that's a, that's a good point um, in terms of, so I guess I'd start by saying, uh, you know, as a nation, Canada has always been a trading-based nation. In fact, we've survived by trading, and our relationship with the United States is one that's thrived and prospered our economy, and it's prospered the United States. It's gotten much country. more complicated since beaver pelts went out of uh, <laughs> Well, in the, yeah, for sure, and there's, there's newer, newer technologies. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but from the perspective of, of sort of where we find ourselves, we do find ourselves in a, in a very, I think, advantageous position. We're already intertwined with the U.S. economy, so greatly uh, connected, and there's so many strong relationships, and that's only intensifying. At the same time, Europe is turning uh, towards North America more and more so than it ever has. And for a number of different reasons, and the, and the invasion being predominantly the one that's most obvious, but e even the economic ties are beginning to strengthen and they're coming together, I think, more closely, which is, I think, a, a, a development that's kind of intensified as of the last year, and I, it, one would expect that to continue. And Canada has some of those resources in the, in the interest, but we have the like-minded, similar interest in sustainability and, and longer term and about building those supply chains as relationships as opposed to transactions. I mean, one of the things about supply chains is a lot of it is just, they, it's conceived under a, a notion of transactions, low cost efficiency, and the notion that it's always available. That, that is different in the critical mineral context. The minerals are not available. They won't be available at the demand and, and at the supply scope that's required. So that isn't a, I can just go buy it on the spot market. It's, I need to build a relationship. And that, they're finite. And as you yeah. point out, there's a, there is a limit and, and a great deal of energy that has to be expended in some cases to get those minerals to market. And can, I, can I say, just, Sorry, not just finite, because one thing we haven't talked so much about is and there's an opportunity for continuous innovation in how to produce them because I, mean, I think both countries were looking at geothermal brine, we're looking at remining opportunities, co-production, right. and there's um, a tremendous amount of opportunity on the research demonstration um, kind of side for public capital to help um, create the new technologies that are going to help find more sustainable ways to produce um, these minerals. And putting well. aside intellectual property, there's no property in good ideas, as the old legal maxim goes, and especially <coughs> in the race to deal with, with yeah. climate change. Diane Francis mentioned uh, carbon sequestration, mm -hmm. and I think batteries is the big, it, it seems to be the big goal that everybody is chasing, but we haven't quite crack that yet. We can't run battleships or even our, our house uh, heating in the Great White North on batteries just yet. Not just yet. I mean, that we haven't touched it, but a component of that is recycling and circular. So, I mean, the one thing about the battery economy that's emerging and energy security that's emerging through mineral security mm -hmm. is that there is an opportunity as we look up into the generation beyond where a, a component of the supply will come from circular economy, from reuse. Samir has mentioned, you know, uh, mining from waste or mining from repurposing existing uh, facilities in, if you will, brownfield. Um, that is opportunity for sure. We, we heard from E3 to this morning, but mm -hmm. we also recognize that, you know, 15 years from now, there'll be batteries that are leaving vehicles that have been on the road for 15 years, and there's an opportunity to reuse that material. Uh, and to a certain degree, metals can be recycled almost indefinitely if, if done properly. So there's innovation potential there. Um, and then there's new, I think, new supply relationships and supply chains that will emerge from that as well. So we, we as government, I think, have to kind of move quickly to incentivize that behavior, but also to kind of make sure that the regulatory environment doesn't create frictions. We're moving recycled goods and, and end-of-life goods and looking at that, that impact. So that's another part of the strategy that we're looking at. It's another place where we can work with partners who are thinking in the same way. And the innovation piece, I think, is, is key. There's so much just incredibly impressive research going on uh, in both our countries. Uh, waste to energy is, is one that uh, is accelerating and taking on more steam, pardon the pun. And uh, I, I, I know we're getting sort of near the end of our uh, allotted time here, but, um, you know, the, the, the security regulations, the um, 
public expectations and demands that, uh, that we are placing on people at a time where we may be approaching, uh, I think most economists believe we are approaching recession, this is also inevitably going to impact on our ability to accelerate both innovation, investment, critical minerals, and, and put even greater emphasis, I would suggest, on incentivizing, to use your word, Jeff, as opposed to punishment, uh, such as increasing taxes. And anyway, not to go down that road, but this is, this is a, a real part of the discussion, I think, as we enter difficult, dark economic times. And so, if you would, not to end on a negative note, but how do our, our countries collectively face that reality? Uh, and is that going to require, for lack of a better term, an appetizer suppressant on some of the ambition around what we're talking here in this overall transition? Jeff, it's okay. Do you want me to go first on sure. that one? Okay. You know, on, on our side, we've we've looked hard at that question. Um, um, you know, it's a really uncertain economic time. Um, uh, today's CPI print had some kind of promising kind of signals in it, but it's just one print. And so, um, you know, we're always looking for um, showing that signs that it, inflation's abating and we're uh, and we know that the Federal Reserve on our side is doing all that it can there. Um, as we look at um, what our legislative efforts have unlocked, what we see um, across um, a series of laws that the president has passed and um, is that we now have a generational amount of public investment dollars, capital, going into physical infrastructure for the clean energy transition and for the digital economy. And there, it, it's, we've um, provided a level of certainty and regulatory clarity that can um, now mobilize private capital and bring um, capital in, in a way that's gonna boost our long-term potential and ease price pressures. Um, in the longer term so you know in many ways we know it's a very uncertain environment but um we think we're well positioned um to move through this especially as we've talked about a lot of the trends we're talking about here are long-term trends so it's about how do you move through the economic cycle but still remain on that longer term trend line of expanding productive capacity for um, these mineral and these uh, clean energy um, supply chains. I mean, think the other thing is uh, U.S. business investment has remained pretty resilient throughout this year. It increased every quarter in 2022. Um, so we're still seeing um, capital formation, um, especially in these sectors, and large announcements, at least on the U.S. side, on batteries, um, on, on minerals, on, um, you know, solar. So, um, so we're we're not we're not overly pessimistic yet. Yeah. No, that's good. I mean, apropos of, of this discussion, a twenty five percent increase in uh, investment between our two countries or trade on the subject of, of mining. Jeff, maybe last word to you, and then we'll go to the audience for a few questions before we wrap up. Yeah, I, I'm not a uh, economic policy expert in terms of inflation, but I would certainly say there's. I think government's using a mix of measures, and we're looking at you know trying to continue to to stimulate the investment in the areas, whether it's through, you know, clean energy tax credits or whether it's through uh, supporting transition for workers and and uh, investments, but it's a mix of things. And I think it strikes me that with the volatility happening and the uncertainty about when inflation is going to kind of uh, erode or, or slow, um, we need to kind of continue to make um, smart decisions and continue to kind of make the right investments that look at the long range of where the trends are going. It's clear we're going to transition to electric vehicles. It's clear that um, you know moving electricity around our respective countries is going to remain uh, an important dimension. So I think infrastructure investments that move along those chains tend to to support a longer term view. The continued volatility in terms of prices and consumers and and uh, and what's happening at a more retail level is a little bit more complex. Uh, some of that's the supply chain reorienting and re-engineering it. It's the rebound of the, the pandemic. There's a number of factors that over the next number of years we're going to see our way through. That's a really interesting point on the, the necessary infrastructure, which uh, I, I'm hoping that there are really smart people like yourselves who are being part of that planning because the perpetual election cycles that both our countries live in 
uh, make it very difficult for the type of long-term planning you're referencing. So folks, uh, some questions from the audience. Yes, here, in the front. Um, my name is Abigail Hunter with the Quebec government. My office is in Washington. Uh, first, I want to say I support the goals of the Global Deal with Good Global Partnership. Um, ABM Le Bonté mentioned this, that provinces have jurisdiction in Canada over, some, over these mineral resources. And then you also mentioned the need for uh, government coordination in the long buildup for the supply chains to be secure, efficient, and competitive. I want to ask both of you, what role do you think states and provinces could play in helping that efficiency so that our manufacturers will actually be able to build these supply chains out, you know, ethically, efficiently, competitively, and then be able to be eligible for the IRA tax credit um, in the next couple of years? Thank you. Terrific. Well, from a dom domestic point of view in Canada, um, there's a working group that we chair as the federal government with all the provinces. Most of the provinces have advanced critical mineral strategies. You would know that Quebec is probably the most advanced of the provinces with its own features of how a government is participating, what the regulatory construct is, what the investments are. So the things that we are doing federally tie together with what the provincial governments are doing in Canada. So we, from a national government point of view, have put out a critical mineral strategy. It went out for comment. The first place we, we consulted and actually worked to update and build the strategies with our provincial partners, recognizing the jurisdiction. But I mean, I think as we kind of extend that out, the similar conversations happening around the world, sort of at you look at indigenous governments, we look at state level governments, subnational governments, and you look at the conversation and it it's still carrying itself through to make sure that there is that right level of collaboration um, that maintains the ability for governments to work together. And then on our side, you know, we have our bipartisan infrastructure law that uh, we enacted. So um, through all the implementing infrastructure that we've set in place here at the federal level, we are doing a lot to build state capacity. Um, we've had um, like um, a, a summit recently on improving project delivery um, that is that was designed to kind of figure out how, what are the be what are best practices that can be shared between states and between the federal government and states on how to um, how to how to how to improve project kind of permitting timelines delivery um, across a range of infrastructure assets. But and we've also set up kind of state level kind of coordinators like at each governor's office to work with us to help really drive more um, efficient collaboration. Um, and ex again, like lifting up best practices so we can start um, having some similar regimes in states around the country. I'm going to go to the back, Alex. Yeah. Um, uh, we, okay, we'll, we'll take two, but please make them really quick. I'm going to bootleg another question in, too, just so we can finish it up. Specific minerals um, and specific opportunities for partnerships that you spend most of your time uh, thinking about. 
That's a great mm. connective question because <laughs> semiconductors is obviously be part of that uh, that thought process. Yeah. I mean, look on um, with with China, we have been very clear that we recognize that um, uh, there are some areas where we can we we are looking for and want to cooperate with with China, and there are some places where we're going to be in a more competitive posture. Um, we have uh, uh, we we maintain strong dialogue, right? Like yeah, the president is hopefully going to be sitting down, and um, but um, we recognize that there are ways in which they are they have um, invested and mobilized uh, state capital to, in ways that um, has uh, uh, really. Uh, hurt the rules-based international order, hurt market-based developments. And so um, our response here is to, and has been, to invest in our own self, invest in our domestic strength, because um, we know they can't compete with our innovation economy, our um, strong IP protections. And so um, we know we've been very consistent saying we welcome the competition. It's a competition we think we're going to win because uh, the U.S. has the best workers, the best companies, and the best investment climate um, at the end of the day, especially for these high technology industries that are poised to really grow, like semiconductors um, and microelectronics, quantum computing, um, and into the clean energy space. Um, on the second question of like some specific areas, you know, on our side, we're, w with the American Battery Materials Initiative that we announced, we're really focused on like five minerals in particular because we think they're so critical to the transition, lithium, cobalt, uh, manganese, graphite, um, nickel, and, um, and uh, the specific areas of cooperation that I think you've, you heard us say earlier include, you know, ways to, to um, to look at um, defense cooperation, defense supply chains, defense-related investments is definitely one area. The second is um, in multilateral for uh, whether it's the Mineral Security Partnership or the G7 and the Partnership for Global Investment. Um, uh, the uh, those are places where we're working together to mobilize our resources to put together um, to really help advance deals uh, overseas, right, to secure the mineral rights and the processing um, that is so important to um, the companies headquartered in, in both of our countries and to making the goods that the consumers need um, in our country um, as well. So those are two places I'd point you. Jeff, last word to you. Yeah, um, thank you. On the on the China question, I think that that's a complicated question. It's going to play itself out. Um, if we knew where it was going, I think we'd all have um, a much greater deal of comfort here in the room about how, how it ex expands. But uh, I'll leave that to, to perhaps China uh, and North America and experts. On the where we're working with the U.S. on a more, uh, Samira's mentioned most of it. So we have a working group we've been working under. We have a supply chain working group led under the White House and the Privy Council Office. Um, so B2B industry engagement, we've been holding seminars between, you know, companies in the United States, companies in Canada, talking about investment opportunities, about projects that are early stage and advanced stage that need the capital and, and ha need offtakes and abilities to work together. We've been working on R&D and innovation. Samir's mentioned some of the targeted minerals, so battery recycling uh, activities about rare earth and, and magnet um, areas where we have, uh, I think, uh, particular dependencies. And then defense as an example. And then I, I wouldn't, um, my scientists would be uh, very disappointed if I didn't point to our geological research and data exchanges between the US Geological Survey and, and the Canadian Geological Survey, um, where we have a lot of work on the exploration side so that we can understand the mineral potential, the resources we have, such that um, you know when they are uh, potentially available for development, that we're, it's very targeted and we can increase the, uh, the return potential and lower the risk. 
And on the recycling side, I haven't, I, I didn't get a chance to talk to you much about that. But you know, in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have money we're putting out for grants and demonstration projects on battery recycling, but also on battery materials. We just um, issued the first set of grants last month on the battery materials side. But that battery materials side is so key to development of that circular economy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a place where we see a lot of opportunity. Samira and Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful, informed comments and for being here and making time to participate.